Joined now by Wednesday regular, one half of the Rain Drags Hockey Podcast, TSN Hockey Insider, the one and only Darren Dreger. How you doing? I'm angry with you people. Uh, oh, and I include, yeah. by you people, I'm going to throw Ferraro into this mix because we did the podcast on Tuesday mm-hmm. and he was boasting of this golf game that he's got lined up for Thursday, tomorrow morning. Mm-hmm. And I don't complain about the weather in, in southern Ontario. Growing up on the prairies, I've been there, done that. Um, and then our weather here generally is very good, but it's like minus three here, I think in Whitby. And I'm thinking of you guys playing golf and I'm very jealous. Yeah. The grass at BMO look pretty green though. I mean, they're, they're, they're finding a way to thaw things out. There's no snow, right? There's not much snow there. No, I I wonder if they must tarp it. Cause I don't notice that myself. Like, I don't know. Maybe they've got some sort of heat lamp mechanism. Yeah. yeah. Did, did, and forgive me if this is uh, happens on the regular, but did I see Ferraro doing the podcast yesterday in front of an unmade hotel bed? Oh, I did not see that. See, I just have the little window that I look oh, into. Okay. But then when you tune in the podcast, and I haven't had a chance to uh, to go over it again. Interesting. That would not be Ray like. That would not be Ray. It would not be Ray like. He wasn't <laughs> complaining about the hotel room. In fact, oh. this is the kinder, softer side of a uh, softer side of Ray now. Um, he was accentuating the positives, which were the the arena was right next door, so there mm-hmm. wasn't any travel issues that Ray would have to endure, and he had won a handful of cash at a blackjack table on Monday night. So. Aside from the 1970s carpet and some of the other stuff that was going on in his room, uh, he seemed pretty happy. So hmm, I'm going to have to check in on that. Yeah, please do. Uh, you uh, were mentioning to us uh, before we started here that you uh, you got a big kick out of Dolly Wall uh, on Friday <laughs> and the uh, discussion, if you want to call it, that we were having uh, about Tyler Myers and his bonus due September 15th. Yeah. Y- you tell me, Drake, do you have any information here? Like, do you think the Canucks could pay this bonus earlier, or does it have to be on September 15th? No, I, I think they could pay it earlier, uh, but that's just my interpretation and, and your know, kind of understanding of a process. I don't have the actual contractual language in front of me here. I believe it's different than July 1st, which is normally the the standard when these bonuses get paid out. And you do have a fiscal calendar that you have to adhere to. Um, And look, I mean, coaches contracts, you know, are are basically uh, revolved around that July 1st kind of target as well. I just can't imagine why anybody would be upset, starting with the player and the agent, if a club came to them in August and said, man, I'd, 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 we just want to pay it. We have to pay it anyway. The money's there. Does it matter? I don't know why they would do that. I mean, mm-hmm. if I were an owner, I'd probably say, look, I pay you millions and millions and millions of dollars. I'm not giving you more ahead of time. So uh, it was it, what entertained me was just how frustrated Dollywall got. Mm-hmm. You know, and I love when he kind of goes off on those tangents, right? <laughs> Where it's like, Matt, Matt, what are you talking about, Matt? Come on. <laughs> That's a pretty good dolly wall. It's not bad. <laughs> so anyway, it was uh, the premise of it, I think, was a bit flawed, to be fair. And I don't know that anybody actually has a firm answer. Maybe Deputy Commissioner Bill Daly can answer it for us. But... Well, the, the whole premise was it was in order to pay the bonus so that you had longer time to try and trade him, right? If exactly. you trade, If you pay that bonus August 1st, you've got a couple of months to trade him as opposed to September right. 15th. That's day one of training camp, for heaven's sake. So. I mean, that makes sense to me, right? Yeah. It, it does. Um Maybe from from that perspective, the Players Association gets involved because, you know, if you're a player who doesn't want to be traded and, you know, you, you don't have the trade protection, in this case, there is that trade there protection, is some, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, maybe the PA gets a little snarly because now you're influencing a summer, right? I mean, these, yes. the, the Players Association, as they should, they protect the time away from these players um as ferociously as they can so it would be interesting to know who asked for the clause because you're right myers might have put it in his trade protection so that you you made it almost impossible to trade him in that summer because you because the the bonus is coming or the team might have said because the cash flow we want it later for some reason and and that's where jp barry would be interesting to me to explain through that process because you're right I mean, almost buyout proof to that point too, right? right? Yeah. Um, because of of the added bonus, so now 
not only is it a troublesome contract to buy out, but you do get that extended opportunity perhaps because there wouldn't be many teams that would step up, frankly, and take on that financial no, burden. No, they no, wouldn't. No. Well, a few things here. Number one, uh, Drag, maybe you can look into it, but I've heard the Canucks pay out bonuses at different times than most NHL teams, yeah, and there nice may thing. well be liquidity uh, issues behind be. that. N- uh, number two, nothing would stop Tyler Myers from saying, no, I, I want the bonus on September right. 15th. I mean, he knows he's getting the money, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, there is no worry here about the Canucks' ability to pay, so he could certainly say Except no. Except two months of interest. If you paid on well, July 15th yeah, on no, $5 million, dollars is <laughs> a decent I'm, bit of change. I'm sure his accountants would disagree, but yeah. his missus might say, honey, we're happy here in Vancouver. Yeah. A- and then, um, you know, thirdly, the, the reason why this is a, an issue going back to last Friday with Rick, (laughs) is that, as Blake says, on September 15th, those teams that are looking to get to the floor, they already have their routes to the floor. They're not worried about having to add salary right at training camp to get to the floor. That's more a July or August pursuit. Now, if if Myers were injured and maybe wasn't, mm, it was possible he wasn't going to come back for an extended period of time, maybe ever, well, then the Arizona Coyotes would like to you know, be the obvious yeah. stuff, yes. wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's their bag. Yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of Arizona, that was a, a leftover tidbit from the meetings a couple of weeks ago, Dregs, where the commissioner said, look, uh, as it stands right now, you know, cap space is a valuable asset. Yeah. He, un- he has no problem with what's going on with <clears throat> Arizona collecting all of these, uh, all these non-playing contracts. And, of course, right. there's a big vote coming up there. In Tempe. uh, Well, there was a development last night, too. uh, That was a weird one. Yeah. And and this is the city of Phoenix pushing back, right? And, you know, without knowing all of the details, just kind of trying to establish that, okay, well, you can't do this for that reason. You know, there's residential property nearby, all of this, the infrastructure that they protected in Phoenix. And Tempe is going, you just mind your own business because you've done it this way and it's worked out for you with all of these uh, multi-purpose facility. So don't tell us in the city of Tempe how to run our show. <laughs> so I was a bit amused by it, but then I'm like, oh no, here we go again. Just another chapter in this never ending book that is being written um, in Arizona specific to the, the, the coyote. So it is going to be an interesting one to follow, but just quickly to wrap up on that. Um, I understand it. And look, it's, it's, it's it's the reason why I push back, and there was a bit of a flare up when I reported an insider trading yesterday that Taylor Hall is essentially ready to play, and the Boston Bruins, for whatever reason, aren't activating him. Uh, I don't think Felino is quite as close, but it's pretty obvious when you look at the cap space of the Boston Bruins, they're not able to activate without doing something significant to create that cap space. Um, and people always say, "Well, that's cap circumvention." Well, is it or isn't it? I mean, again, what the National Hockey League does exceptionally well is monitor all of these cases. They really, truly do. And even though on the outside looking in, it it looks like the potential of that. If we go back to Arizona and everything that they've done in acquiring this dead money and these contracts and players are never going to play, it's all within the rules. You can argue that the rules are flawed, and I appreciate that. And maybe next time around, the owners, the, the, the presidents, the general managers will push a little bit harder at, at Commissioner Bettman or whomever is the commissioner in negotiating a new CBA and saying, OK, well, we can't do this again. But right now, Arizona is operating under the rules. Yeah, and uh, that, is, that is very interesting because I think this year more than ever, what we saw was teams who had players in LTI just load on up and say, we'll figure it out later. And the yeah. figuring out later, I can understand, might uh, might be at the to the detriment of some players and some and, and their agents. Mm. Um, was really interested by what you reported on Insider Trading this week. An all 32 night... Or a yeah. continuous game night yeah. involving the European uh, European series. Explain there. Yeah, conceptual ideas, um, and I'm all for it. I, I I think that the NHL has to continue, uh, like the other sports do, at, at thinking outside the box and doing simple things that can be very creative, and enhance you know the property that you have. And I you know the reason I got poking around on it, frankly, fellows, 
was Saturday, this past Saturday. And, you know, the game started at, what, 1 o'clock Eastern and then went through the Pacific region. And it was game after game. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I know the gambling people loved it because they're sitting on their couch with prop bets and doing all this stuff. And it's it's like NFL Sunday. I mean, you're just, you're constantly engaged. March Madness, yes. So I got poking around thinking, I wonder if the NHL is going to do more of this. And then I was led astray by a couple of these other ideas. So quickly, it would happen early in the season. Um, and that Saturday, by the way, at 15 games, so 30 NHL clubs. But they've never had all 16. They've never had full 32. So they're hoping to do that. It would likely be a weekday early in the season. And then the, the bigger idea, which is a bit more complicated, of course, would be a continuous flow of games which could be world record setting from a professional hockey perspective. And maybe it links with a global series in Europe where the games start over there and then they go to the Pacific region and then they eventually, you know, come uh, into central and Eastern Canada and away you go from there. And, and they feel like there's a way that they could really basically cover off almost 20 hours of hockey in a 24 hour time frame. <laughs> I mean, Okay, it's a one day, it's a special event. Why wouldn't everybody kind of get a kick out of that and embrace it? Good idea for uh, the NHL to stage a neutral site game in St. John's, right? To get ahead of things. Yes. Stick it way out there, have it on the half hour, you know, for sure. Really throw a wrench into things. A little stagger for sure. Uh, Lastly, for me, Dregs, and we discussed this a little bit yesterday, boy, like Pierre Luc Dubois seems to be forcing his way to the Montreal Canadiens and. You tell me, Winnipeg, if they were to miss the playoffs this year, is that a significant retool or rebuild that would happen? In well, I would say, yeah, it's all possible, Matt. I mean, all bets would be off because, you know, Pierre-Luc Dubois is the most obvious, right? Because his contract issue continues to drag and he's still a restricted free agent property of the Winnipeg Jets. So, you know, he's their property to do with what they will. Um I'm I'm a bit amused by some of the reporting that just automatically connects him to the Montreal Canadiens. Of course, Montreal has interest in Pierre-Luc Dubois. Um, They should, as many teams would. But until he's an unrestricted free agent, it's not like they can put dibs down. That's not how it works. So if this retool is going to happen in the summer, and Dubois makes it clear he's not going to extend ever, and and Pierre-Luc Dubois would be a priority in Winnipeg. And frankly, for me, he's ahead of Mark Shifley. And Shifley still has term left on his deal. But if you know you can't sign him, then the decision has to be made, okay, when's the best time to trade him? And if Montreal steps up, pays that premium, all right, then you make that deal. Beyond Dubois, though, look, there's always specula- uh, speculation around Mark Shifley. And if you guys, I know you watch, he, there's something not right there. He's not he, he's he's not as engaged as he needs to be. He clearly, isn't on the same page as Rick Bonus, the head coach. So that's problematic. So you go from a position of strength up the middle of the ice with Shifley, Pierre Luc Dubois, to now all of a sudden you're you're thinking about trading those two. Holy smokes! Like what are you getting back in return? And then right around the corner is the expiring contract, Connor Hellebuck. Does anybody think Connor Hellebuck is going to have his hand in the air to say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in for a renovation or a rebuild? I don't think that's going to happen. So no we'll see. Career. There's some heavy yeah. lifting ahead. Wanted yep. to ask you about the, the Alberta teams here as well. Uh, five point night for Ryan Nugent Hopkins. They are poised to have three 100 point players Nuts. on their team this season. It is truly 80s kind of stuff from the Oilers. And then you've got the the flames, the big money flames, just clawing and grabbing and trying to find every point. It's it's an interesting test in Alberta as we see both of these teams having different levels of success and then the expectation. And I hope Calgary gets into the playoffs yeah, me too. just to see what happens right? because they could flick a switch. Yeah, I yeah. don't know, but I, I'm fascinated by those two teams right now. Well, look, and I say me too because I, I, I'm, I'm the same as you, Blake. I'm fascinated to see what Calgary could do and if momentum right. you know, gives them that sort of, of intestinal fortitude that they've lacked all season long. Not at the expense of the Winnipeg Jets, and that seems to be clearly what would have to happen. Right. But unfortunately for Winnipeg, that'll be on Winnipeg because Calgary has not done very much over the standard of this season 
to imply that they are playoff worthy. So we'll see. And then if they don't make the playoffs, Calgary, that is, or they're dispatched in short order. Now you got to wonder of all the things that are going to happen in, in Calgary with that team, both in the front office and the roster Edmonton, they're a beast. Um, you know, they, an offensive they got, beast at least. Yeah. Well, right. but they got yeah. bigger too, right? I mean, yeah. Mateus Ekholm is a, is a big man. Bugstad adds size up front. Like they're, they're tough to handle, and they're going to be tough to handle. I Honestly, I don't think that enough people are talking about the year that Ryan Nugent Hopkins has had in Edmonton, aside from now the obvious where he's he's approaching the 100-point plateau. But what a run he has had. He, you know, they, they ground him into submission on that contract extension, and there were people around Edmonton, around the Oilers fan base that said, that's too much. No, no, no. Like, you can replace him. Now five million and change is Can a you bargain. It? It's Can't, an absolute for five bargain more years. Yeah, I know I mean, it'll eventually probably wear out its welcome, but maybe for the next two yeah. to three years. My God, what great, value that great is! Value. Honestly, uh, I didn't even know he was approaching ninety points. So you're quite right about no yeah. one's uh, talking. Yeah. And the pride of Burnaby here, uh, yeah. first overall draft pick, right? He's got more points than Elise Patterson, yeah. um, which is crazy. Greg's marvelous stuff. Thank you for this. We'll catch up next Wednesday. All right, guys, have a good one.